will only add to your excellent uh, biography that uh, for the um, Americans of my generation of the 50s, the great political event, and I say this because I think people don't really remember how important it was, was the Cuban Revolution, 1959. Fundamental, a re-beginning of revolutionary uh, action and... and um, uh, and realization. It's very good to be here in Berlin again. And um, uh, as Jürgen said, I studied here 60 years ago, which is, uh, seems quite long ago now. Um, I, uh, I'm grateful for this invitation uh, to this august place. Um, and I thank you all for coming. Uh, and I want to apologize to the absent public um, in the other room uh, for not being able to um, have any direct contact with them. Um, globalization and representation. This could be a literary problem, raising issues of imagination, of mimesis and allegory, of language and its limits. It could be a philosophical, even a theological problem, in which Kant's discussion of the sublime, Hegelian absolute knowledge, the opposite, opposition of totality and, and singularity of freedom and determinism raise their ugly heads, or a psychoanalytic one in which the big other and the Lacanian real, along with the Althusserian analysis of ideology, are entangled. Finally, it could not but be political. And in fact, the basic question, the basic dilemma, is all of the, these things together, uh, and hopefully we can suggest something of this multiplicity uh, of the stakes in play tonight uh, by insisting on the historically new uh, uh, kinds of problems, the representation of globalization, or maybe the impossibility of representing it, raises. At any rate, I want to begin uh, by stressing two features of that impossibility, the unimaginably complex financial networks which are now operating at a speed uh, which greatly transcends uh, anything the human mind is capable of, and the equally unimaginable numbers of people living on the earth today. Finance capital and population, these are the two extremes between which the impossibility of, representation, uh, of representing globalization deploys itself. Numbers and statistics are substitutes for thinking, for thinking that enormity, and not the thought itself, of which perhaps only paradoxes can awaken the impossibility. For this is one of those modernist theological cruxes in which to reach a limit, a sense of the impossibility of the thought, is somehow dialectically the same as the impossible thought itself. And here's an example. It's said that more people are alive today than have ever lived in the whole of human history added together. A synchrony which virtually obliterates diachrony, a presentism, as the French now say, in terms of which the entire human past weighs as nothing. If so, then such a paradox offers a kind of via negativa for thinking the impossible sum of the billions of others with whom we coexist as isolated individuals, biological individuals. Now, I want to make clear that we're talking here about the content of globalization rather than its form. We're still trying to assess the difficulties of what we may call a mimetic or representational conception of the thing, its head-on approach as a picture or vi vision. We'll come to the formal problems later on. And we will henceforth limit ourselves to the second of our two motifs, that of population. A number of recent works and expository descriptions have tried to grapple with the financial side of globalization and demand their own assessment, for which we really don't have time tonight. Yet there exists, as far as population is concerned, an older idea which may be taken as a premonition of our problem. Um, uh, as an anticipation of the conceptual dilemma at the same time that as a concept it attempts a representational solution of its own. 
when we remember that that imagining that once new thing, the nation state, uh, historically presented representational problems analogous to those with which we're currently grappling, um, uh, even though the domestication and habituation of the idea of the nation has ended up persuading us that the, this new entity was somehow on a human scale and thereby more accessible to the human mind. Uh, remembering this, it won't seem at all surprising that at this point we should confront the thinker who virtually reinvented the problem of imagining the nation for us, namely Benedict Anderson. In his seminal work, Imagine Communities, drawing on Auerbach's thoughts on the theological imagination, Anderson draws our attention to a strange concept, both old and new in its successive historical contexts, namely the concept, or perhaps I should say the problem, of si simultaneity. And now I'm going to quote a, a little passage from Benedict Anderson's book. Our own conception of simultaneity has been a long time in the making, and its emergence is certainly connected in ways that have yet to be well studied with the development of the secular sciences. But it's a conception of such fundamental importance that without taking it into account, we'll find it difficult to probe the obscure genesis of nationalism. What has come to take the place of the medieval conception of simultaneity a long time is, to borrow from Walter Benjamin, an idea of homogeneous empty time, uh, in which simultaneity is, as it were, transverse, cross-time, marked not by prefiguring and fulfillment, as was medieval time, but by temporal coincidence and measured by clock and calendar. He goes on to locate traces of this new consciousness of simultaneity in literature, and indeed in the simultaneities that make up the staple of that fundamental uh, uh, form, which is the novel, and that fundamental novelistic form, which is melodrama. And this is the right way to proceed, I think, for the emergence and eventual primacy of certain narrative forms is a crucial symptom uh, of that new time sense, which is itself the symptom and expression of a new system uh, of human relations. So it is that melodrama relies for its most, most characteristic effects on simultaneities and the character's ignorance of them, uh, unbeknownst to him at much the same time, meanwhile, or more classically, in another part of the forest, contingencies, the chance meeting that resolves that ignorance or creates new mysteries, is itself only the external sign of the larger social phenomenon, which is simultaneity itself. Uh, it's therefore not surprising that in our time in which social simultaneity uh, has reached a scale quite unimaginable to the readers and writers of the earlier nation-state, this narrative form should reappear in new and striking guises, uh, as if newly minted and brilliant in its novel virtuosity. Film is the new vehicle for such new effects, and among many uh, and over more practices of what I will call the loop in time, I'm, I'm going to single out the great Mexican director, Gonzalez Iñárritu, whose Amores Peros, I think many of you have seen this from 2000, from 2000 offers a textbook example of the seemingly accidental knot of destinies in which simultaneity balefully imposes its necessity. All kinds of plot lines coming together at once in the city. Now, I think that for Iñárritu, such complex narrative loops and knots have an essentially theological meaning, which can't be ours. And indeed, as Anderson suggests, the form itself has its theological origin, in the, simulta in, in the simultaneous eternity of God's knowledge of the world, past, present, and future, uh, uh, all at once. But we'll read it in another way, which Iñárritu's own artistic development confirms, for his next film, Babel, Babel, of 2006, marks an advance over the earlier drama of simultaneity within a single city, and makes an ambitious leap 
onto the dimension of the new world space itself, with its simultaneous plots set in Morocco, Japan, and the Mexican border of the United States. Here at once, therefore, we can observe the way in which the form loops in time immediately summons the content of globalization to itself, as though there were some elective affinities between them. But things are not so simple. You may recall how Benedict Anderson's discussion of simultaneity is immediately followed by his great discovery that it is newspapers that link people together within the new form of the nation-state. In the city, indeed, it is the newspaper itself, uh, in the newspaper, that we find the mediation between the social realities of simultaneity and their expression uh, uh, in, a, in a specific cultural and literary form. And that mediation is what we call the fait divers. It is the fait divers, indeed, which draws together all the threads of the climactic accident, the catastrophic coming together of simultaneous destinies, which it then recounts in a form that expresses both irony and destiny all at once. The irony of destiny is such, if you prefer. How it should be that, for example, the ambulance racing the victim to the hospital should have struck and killed the long-lost mother of this same victim, and so on and so forth. These are the encapsulated um, squibs or vignettes in which an urban coexistence from time to time ironically expresses itself in reality. Unfortunately, on the global level, there is no form that corresponds to this one of the city in the fait divers, the newspaper, no connective tissue which, like the newspaper, links all these destinies. The computer is no doubt a kind of equivalent, but of a very different type, and for which the older forms are really not suited, but that's just an opinion. Meanwhile, at the new global level, something else comes into play, which I'll call the Lessing or the Le Leakoan principle, uh, as you know, in his classic essay on the Leakwan statuary, Lessing had demonstrated the relative incompatibility between the visual and the temporal arts, or better still, since film, in a way, blurs the contours, um, between painting and sculpture on the one hand, uh, and the narrative arts on the other, between the Nibbanananda and the Nachananda, the arts based on a coexistence of the elements and those organized around their succession in time. Melodrama and the novel, of course, and their filmic equivalents, are organized around a succession of events in time. Um, sculpture and painting, however narrative, can only be organized around the so-called pregnant moment, something quite distinct from that coming together of simultaneous destinies we've been evoking for works such as Amoris Peros. But as I've tried to indicate, the fait divers is what allows us to think local simultaneities together in some loosely atemporal way, in a present of time which, like the convulsion of Leakoan and his sons, seems, although narrative, to step for a moment outside of time, or at least outside of time passing. This cannot be said, I think, for Iñárritu's film Babel, uh, nor for any of the ambitious works which try to use this form to capture postmodern simultaneity, or if you like, the simultaneities of globalization. And this is really the heart of our problem. I maintain that nothing exists on the global level which can capture the more local loops in time that the city or even the nation accommodate. The latter can be thought and represented. How something analogous could be achieved on the level of globalization remains our question here. We must acknowledge that for the most part, authors and filmmakers have avoided the more difficult dilemmas of temporality and, and have reverted to global space as a medium for this historically new reality, that is, space rather than sign. I think, for example of an intelligent British television series called Traf Traffic, with a K, from, 2000, from, sorry, from 1989. It's not the same as the, the not-so-good American film that was ripped off from it, um, nor is it the same as the American sequel. Uh, uh, um, so here in this British series, we have a narrative 
which follows a kind of documentary rhythm. Um, uh, it's a story of, of uh, drugs. Um, and it traces the origins of these of the drug in the poppy fields of Afghanistan uh, um, uh, through its distillation and transportation to Europe and the port of Hamburg to its final destination at the hands of addicts in London. This makes for three separate plots which can tr- be dramatically interspliced so as to narrativize what is essentially the map of a trade route. And the trade route, although not exactly a literary or narrative form, despite instances like road movies or, or the picaresque novel, is certainly one representational candidate for a form of global mapping, of globalized mapping. Yet trade routes have always been with us, as the discovery of Chinese potsherds uh, in the Indus River Valley or Polynesian uh, seashells in Africa testified. Indeed, atlases exist in which you can observe or map read the roots, these roots um, uh, uh, um, as regular and predictable as the ocean currents themselves, for which maps also exist. Um, you can observe uh, the roots of specific types of cargo moving around the globe, specific types of shipping or the nationalities of the great merchant fleets or non-nationalities, as the case may be. These do not have to be contemporary or synchronic. One can well imagine a series of maps or overlaying transparencies in which the historical evolution of any one of these trajectories would be made visible. Containing them might well, however, be work for a computer, in other words, for something a little more powerful than the individual human imagination. But it might also present an interesting task for artistic invention and creativity. Still, there are several objections to be made to the candidacy of this kind of mapping for a satisfactory representation of the globalized system. And that includes, uh, incidentally, an objection to my own rather one-dimensional slogan of cognitive mapping as well, if you are familiar with that. One objection is, of course, the purely visual nature of maps and their seeming incompatibility with narrative as such, even when you compare maps of the same trajectories at different historical eras. And that's perhaps the return of this blessing principle in a new form. But the second and perhaps um, more um, uh, uh, fundamental version of this first objection uh, has to do with the way we tend to reintroduce crime or let's just say the exception, back into routine uh, or, or normal legality, if you prefer, the technical dimensions of shipping, say, or flight paths, which might be material for an interesting documentary, but only play a secondary role in narrative as such generally. And the problem is a more generalized one, I think, just as popular literature tends to approach science fiction as the outer limit of catastrophes inherent in 21st century daily life, so also the social novel has tended recently towards the mystery or crime novel, which have become a fundamental tool for the exploration of social life and the representation of the extremes of experience rarely related uh, on the surface of the everyday. Uh, That is to say, the very rich and the very poor, as well as the fundamental corruption which keeps the capitalist system going and which is universal. I'm implying, in other words, that criminal traffic affords a better mapping of globalization than does normal trade and exchange. Whether that has to do with the sex trade and the kidnapping of women and children for prostitution, or with illegal financial deals, or indeed the dumping of merchandise in ways generally condemned by the various international trade agreements. As with the older age of conquest, uh, global relations today are opened up by brutal interventions and by violence of all kinds. But it's first important to grasp the global relations of traffic, this series I'm talking about, as an intervention, as as an intersection, sorry, between two modes of production, two historical modes of production. On the one hand, we have the world of the peasants, essentially a feudal world in which seemingly modern businessmen still fill the counterpart roles of the nobles or chieftains 
with their feudal retinues and their host of retainers and dependents from thugs to middlemen, from dependent families to house servants and the staff uh, of a chemical plant, which is essentially a cottage industry in this feudal realm. Uh, for this uh, world, the product is essentially a crop, and the opium processed from it something like a, like a luxury item, as much earlier were pepper and spices uh, in the first Renaissance trade routes. For the Europeans, however, at the other end of these, this series of plots, um, these material products are reevaluated in terms of money and capital. They become abstract and the addictions that pay for them are simply elements uh, in a marketing strategy. The three intertwined plots thus isolate different dimensions of this trafficked object, which has become a commodity. The Pakistani subplots, Pakistan and, and Afghanistan combined, the Pakistani subplot shows it not merely as an object of labor and industrial transformation, but in a beautiful image early on, as part of the natural world, a whole field of blue buds swaying in the wind, a harvest of striated surfaces, sweating the gum and sap from a pattern of cross hatchings. And in accordance with an old aesthetic doctrine, this object is then shown at every moment in the production process, loaded onto trucks, boiled down in the factories, packaged for shipment, orders and quantities arranged by underlings at the bidding of the masters. In Hamburg, then, the perspective is reversed, and we attempt to register the passage of this cargo under the form of clues. We have that most interesting type of policeman figure, not the crooked one, but one driven by a ferocious hatred for the criminals and without any kind of private life at all, likely to get into trouble for his own obsessions. Uh, his own um, obsession for justice, but um, uh, uh, but for this um, pursuit. Uh, this is not exactly a duel between good and evil, but a tug of war over abstraction. The elegant dealer, the drug dealer, is not interested in the object, but only in its abstract value and the luxurious life it allows him to lead. At an even further remove after his arrest, his wife is only interested in freeing him, and continuing the business. This is, as it were, a stage in the representation of capital or globalization in which the content or essence of the object involved is unimportant or interchangeable. For the 19th century, this would have given us stories of exemplary businesses, mining or wheat, meat, trains and automobiles and so on. For globalization, we have rather to do with prostitution or illegal aliens, weapons of whatever kind, uh, forged currency, cigarettes, and so on and so forth. And finally, on a third and, let's say, existential level, there is the suffering of the addict and her family, the physical bodily dimension of the object of, of consumption. If the previous subplot was too abstract, this one is almost too concrete and stages a different kind of collective unit, not the feudal retinue with a master and his unworthy son and faithful servant, not the nuclear family with the expensive husband uh, and the faithful wife, but the father and daughter, bound together by shame and misunderstanding, uh, by political decision-making and the impossibility of personal decision. And I should say that this British uh, traffic series ends on a far bleaker note than its uh, American counterpart and draws ambitious and universal political and social consequences, which are not those of some facile American war on drugs from the impossibility of the cure. Impossible. So these are, as I've said, the three dimensions of the object itself, farming and production, or labor power and exploitation, profit making, the realization of value, um, uh, transportation and delivery, and finally consumption, which is to say addiction and petty street sales. Uh, these are indeed three allegorical levels uh, um, to which we must add, I think, also the immense variety of the languages of landscape, the helicopter traveling across the endless hills of Pakistan with their poppy-growing valleys, 
the distinctiveness of the port of Hamburg with its cranes and tunnel and its villas, the drab row houses of London and its deteriorated poorer sections. The cross-cutting here becomes very rapid indeed, from the mountains along the Afghan border to the cityscape of Karachi and the sea, from third to first world and back, along with some of the uh, the main characters, a well-nigh simultaneous juxtaposition of opium production, customs and police work in airports and waterways, and the miseries of addiction in the great first world cities. This is indeed what we now need to re- retain, not so much spatiality as the simultaneities of space. And the word I'm currently interested in to, 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 to crystallize this further um, uh, may also end up having that kind of effect, although I think we must resist it, and that is the word incommensurable, which, borrowed from Niels Bohr's physics, tries to convey the empirical fact of dimensions which coexist without intersecting, distinct realities which cannot be mediated uh, into one another, or if you prefer, codes which cannot be translated into one another. It is this multidimensionality of globalization today which it seems to me is missed uh, in most approaches to it and which, with which we must now deal if we were to pursue our inquiry into its representability any further. I've actually already begun to evoke the incommensurable by enumerating the two fundamental planes of eminence of the phenomenon of globalization, namely uh, the financial system, uh, the new finance capital, and on the other hand, the population explosion, uh, the, the new production of unemployment, if you like, around the world. No doubt this is shorthand for rich and poor, but my point is rather that today these traditional things which you could evoke if you like, in terms of um, sl- slogans like the income gap, uh, but which could very easily coexist in Chaplin films uh, as well as in modern tales of Wall Street, are today somehow, these dimensions, rich and poor, incommensurable. They've drifted apart into separate worlds, what I'm calling dimensions. Abstract ideas of causality no longer have any purchase on them. Phenomenologies of concrete daily life don't express them either. In short, representation cannot handle both within a unified vision, since each one is somehow henceforth unthinkable uh, in its own unique way. But nonetheless, let me try to first to convey a more adequate sense of the co- consequences of the word incommensurable by way of an image. There exists, or so at least science fiction would have us believe, but I think it does exist, there exists such a thing as three-dimensional or even multi-dimensional chess. Here we somehow navigate the boards at at, at, at one time and with one move, each one having a different value on these multiple chess boards uh, before us. We might indeed... On the one hand, uh, um, win uh, uh, on one board and lose on another at the same time and with the same move. At any rate, the challenge is to exist in several distinct dimensions at one and the same time. Ideally, what we've been calling simultaneity or the new simultaneity is something like that, not merely having a watch that tells the same time uh, in its in the various time zones, but one which somehow registers the different clock times we occupy in the various spaces, uh, in these various spaces at one and the same time. And so you could see how science fiction as a form might accommodate something like this. I would cite, uh, for example, there's a wonderful novel by Lauren Bukes, um, The Shining Girls, where a time-traveling serial killer stalks his victims back and forth uh, through the decades. Uh, But now we need a more realistic illustration of this strange phenomenon, and rather than turn to fiction, whether in literature or film, I will take take my demonstration from world sport, uh, and indeed from that game we call soccer, but you and everybody else in the world call football, a word which I will now, from now on, uh, use. Um, In our present context, football may be considered as a combination of chess and stamp collecting. 
It is, of course, also many other things. If you wanted to talk about global corporations, for example, it offers some prime examples more public than most. If you wanted to oppose the nation to the global, this is a place where nationalism still exists. If you wanted to institute comparisons with literature and weigh the significance of the World Cup against that of the Nobel Prize, I think you might find some unexpected analogies. But in the present context, our interest is in incommensurability and in the coexistence of these different dimensions, and that's how I want briefly to deal with football. So, the national, that's the break. That's okay. Um, the national frameworks uh, of, uh, of this sport, uh, in fact, reinforce uh, these new dimensions, both internally and externally, and they're um, at first, more paradoxical and contradictory, if you want a stronger word, at a lower micro level in the effects of, let's say, the personnel. For now, uh, the players of one, because a lot of these things are going on within the nation, uh, but um, uh, on, uh, on the scale we're interested in, the players of one nationality are recruited to play in the still local teams of another, uh, of another nation, reflecting the strengths and differences of the often quite distinct national traditions uh, of play of footballs. So thus, one country may not produce the right kind of appropriately talented and trained player for some particular function in the, in the lineup, which the players of a different national tradition supply abundantly. This often, or let's say this more recently, has um, uh, made for a varied personnel in which players of several distinct nationalities cooperate side by side, in some cases um, that I can think of outnumbering the locals altogether. That's a recent development. Meanwhile, the gaps are then filled by Brazilians, a kind of reserve army of labor more skillful than almost any other national pool. But in the gradual uh, uh, and as I say, fairly recent introduction of foreign players uh, into national teams, what needs to be underscored is the most interesting dialectical intersection of all. When the international player, the foreign player, in Britain, for example, is called upon to return to his home country, Italy, Ghana, whatever you like, in order to train for, uh, in, a more, in a properly national cup there, for competition in the World Cup. This is then a level of international dimensionality which not only transcends the national and the local, but returns to strengthen the latter in the form of innumerable national and regional uh, competitions. For at a certain point, first in isolated and individual cases, then more and more on a market basis, with rules established for the international buying and selling of players, Teams, as I say, begin to recruit players from other foreign teams. Domestically, of course, there's the training of younger generations of players from the, at, uh, at the home team itself, and then the more, not in, um, the more notorious cases in which a star player is lured away from one team to another, generally to the chagrin of the local public, uh, who then hates this player. Uh, to which we may add a less scandalous promotional system in which players, as they become better known and more highly regarded uh, for their individual strengths and skills, rise from a lower-ranking league in that country to a higher one. And on top of this, as someone pointed out to me, there's a whole business of, um, uh, what do you call it when you wear the Adidas or sponsorship? Uh, because there's some very interesting uh, uh, paradoxical intersections of, of the sponsorship of these the teams, the players, and so on. But what I have in mind is the recruitment of stars or potential stars from foreign teams. As I say, uh, clearly Brazilians and Argentinians are enthusiastically sought after by weaker European teams, while the stars from these countries, perhaps after serving time in a lesser national team, are wooed by the most famous ones. 
But this means, as I've tried to suggest already, that the two systems, these two systems, uh, may begin to cross here. For the foreign player will then return to his home country to play in the national team, uh, either the, the World Cup team or the Olympic team, often against his own teammates who disperse to the unified squads of their own nationalities. This is an intersection far more significantly fraught than the encounters between former teammates in this or that national or regional system. Um, so when you pass from one English team to another. And it conjures up a bizarre double standard in which a given player exists in two modes of being, so to speak, defined by the subsystem in which he is simultaneously a member, the national, uh, the, the, the local uh, team and his own nationality. Um, like a word that has two meanings or a sound that can constitute two distinct words um, at the same time. Meanwhile, something of an inverse situation obtains for those players whom one coach chooses for membership in the national team of the World Cup, while they're excluded from the Olympic version by another coach who constructs his team uh, along different lines. At any rate, there it, it is the circulation of these, as it were, permanently foreign players through the various systems that seems to me most characteristic of the mapping dilemmas uh, for a world system. For as in multidimensional chess, they occupy different positions in different planes at one and the same time. So the soccer player, um, football player, caught between his origins, his home team, and his national representation is only the most dramatic figure for the multidimensionality of, of globalization we seek to characterize here. But this particular figuration works only if we understand that it's a question of radical dissonance rather than harmony, and also and above all that each of these levels, as well as the intersections between them, are always a matter of conflict and not of simple filiation. The dilemma posed by such analogies and relationships is that they must all, always def be defined negatively rather than in terms of positivities. In conclusion, then, I want to offer a few speculations about ways in which such, uh, um, such um, phenomena uh, might be represented. We have, first of all, two distinct sets of criteria here. One has to do with the Lessing principle. In other words, the necessity in any representation as vast and complex, as properly sublime as, uh, in Kant's sense, as globalization. The necessity for simultaneity to take precedence over sequence, even when the latter is conceived as process. Modernism in philosophy and the arts, probably in life or reality as well, was dominated by the replacement of notions of substance by those of process. Perhaps now we can begin to observe a new epistemological great transformation in which process is itself being raised by synchrony, uh, re replaced by synchrony, if not by simultaneity as such. The other conclusion to which we've been led is the one centered on incommensurability, which can be translated into a sense of distinct dimensions, the popular version being the thought experiments centered on a multiplicity of different worlds. That's not just science fiction, but the philosophers do that too. Uh, now, if we put these two things together, simultaneity and multidimensionality, we come up with a formula uh, which may be suggestive. It calls for literary practices in which, narrative practices if you prefer, in, with, in which uh, within one dimension the invisible presence of another absent one uh, is somehow suggested. If we want to convey this in terms of temporality, we might imagine the narrative of a series of events behind which, at the same time as which, a wholly different and unrelated series of events is going on. So you can think of the, the example of the classical structure of the detective story, perhaps. Two radically distinct temporalities, that of the crime and the criminal and his victim, and that uh, temporality of the detective and the investigation uh, and solution or not. Here, the narrative of the crime lies in the past. That of the detective constitutes our narrative present. 
But what if both were simultaneous in such a way that during the very present of the investigation, we could also sense the concurrent passage of time of the criminal action as such? Something like that might well be called for in narratives of globalization, where a contingent narrative of a particular present situated, say, in a, in a ghetto or slum, is somehow able to reveal within and behind itself some, the more universal and all-encompassing, more properly, uh, uh, the worldwide process of financial manipulation uh, and control. That's something like that is what um, uh, is suggested, I think, by the narrative category of conspiracy. The bank is a conspiracy against the nation, uh, in a well-known saying of Brecht. Uh, and this is why um, the most resolute attempts to reach satisfactory narrative versions of globalization today must uh, so often have recourse to that ideology of conspiracy. A conspiracy being not so much a motivation or even a form of group association as it is, uh, a, as I say, a narrative category, a certain form of, of the relationship between these two incommensurable levels. So that might be one type of plot emerging from our inquiry, a synthesis of the notions of simultaneity and dimensionality or incommensurability. But let me try another one, perhaps of a more political cast. We spoke, I think I mentioned before, the role of allegory in any national consciousness, a, a term I use just for shorthand. We've also emphasized over and over again incommensurability, have invoked multi, multidimensional chess. What if something like that could be constructed around the tension between the national form uh, and the global or globalized transnational networks? We may here indeed deploy the popular psychoanalytic notion of subject positions. So that so the one allegorical figure, we might call it generally labor with a capital L, is locked in a class struggle within the nation state with its obvious adversaries. For the nation as a whole, labor is an allegorical figure, but it also brings with it, with it its own internal allegorical cast of characters, its friends and foes, as Schmidt says, uh, capital, the parties, business, uh, ethnic groups, and so forth. Labor then occupies a central place in some Althusserian ideological representation of a national class struggle among these enemies, uh, among these entities. Now, if we broaden our canvas and think of labor movements in other countries, I think of steel workers in Korea, for example, a place to which the world steel industry has migrated uh, in an epoch of deindustrialization uh, uh, and outsourcing in the first world. At this point, the collective character called American labor becomes a foe to that other uh, uh, collective uh, character called Korean labor. That is to say that on one chessboard, uh, these characters are structurally linked. On the other, the same figures are opposed, much as football, the football players evoked earlier are simultaneously teammates and rivals of each other in the same multidimensional system. Global multidimensionality means occupying two contradictory or opposing allegorical subject positions simultaneously, thereby paralyzing political struggle as such, which, as you see, then has to have two distinct meanings uh, on the two chessboards in question, the national one and the world one. Unfortunately, there may be many more chessboards in play than these two, but it seems to me that the figure in question can give us another useful way in which we can pose the problem uh, and make its representation more vivid and dramatic for us, so that's a first lesson. It's more important to pose the problem, to produce it, uh, as the Althusserians used to say, than to seek a still uh, chimeric uh, solution and certainty. Uh, a second lesson would be the implication that for this kind of problem, a literary problem still, there can be only one solution at a time. From older problems of the representation of older and perhaps simpler forms of collectivity, there often emerge new literary forms. The epic at one moment, the novel at another, so film yet a uh, later one, 
forms which can accommodate a variety of contingent social content despite their formal and structural stability, the fact that you do one after another and you have the same form or genre. In our situation, that of globalization, I think that no such stable and more generally serviceable form is conceivable. The success of one representation, of a single representation, is ad hoc. Uh, the form can't be reused, uh, uh, can't be repeated. A new and singular invention is always required. Finally, maybe a positive lesson for literary and cultural theory. It's that our specialized problems are also political problems. That the analysis of purely literary and figural or linguistic topics such as allegory and narrative is at one with all our current political uh, dilemmas and has profound and more general social consequences. I don't say that this kind of investigation can help us solve those political dilemmas, but then it didn't solve our literary ones either. Practice does not emerge from theory, but rather the other way around. Thank you. Thank you.